up, you guys, and welcome to another episode of The Girl Who Talks Sports, the podcast where we talk sports and other girly things. I am Sam Cardona, and thank you guys so, so much for listening today. So, we have a really great show lined up today. I feel like I say that every single week, but I'm super excited, and we have a great show lined up today. We had James and Katie from Across the Pond podcast come on, and we did a nice little international thing going on. James is from Scotland. Katie lives in Colorado, which isn't international but we were all in three different time zones when we recorded it so it's super exciting and i'm really excited to show that interview to you guys but before we get into all that obviously we have to do our plugs so don't forget to subscribe on apple Podcasts, google Podcasts, spotify wherever it is that you get your podcasts from and make sure that you leave a review especially on apple Podcasts. that is super helpful for me and you can find us on youtube the girl who talks sports make sure that you subscribe to the channel We put out full-length podcast episodes, we put out mini-segments, we put out extra content videos, a bunch of really cool stuff, and um, I'm super excited. I have some extra content videos that I'm going to record this week, so make sure that you turn on notifications to make sure that you don't miss anything that I put up on the YouTube channel. And finally, don't forget to follow us on social media, TGWTS Podcast, TGWTS Podcast, The Girl Who Talks Sports Podcast. Um, so make sure that you follow us on Twitter and on Instagram. We are both, both of them are the same. I've been super active on Twitter recently. So, um, yeah, it's a fun place. It's a really fun place. So make sure that you follow us there for updates, funny things, all that good stuff. So before we get into our Across the Pond podcast, uh, interview, I have one thing that I just want to mention just really quick, real, real, real quick. Um, and it was from the Monday night game, and we'll, we'll talk about some other things from the Monday night game with the Bills and the Patriots a little later on in the episode, uh, but there's just this one graphic that they showed, and it was uh, Cam Newton's routine when he wakes up in the morning, and it basically said, like, you know, 4.20 a.m., uh, alarm goes off, right? And then it said, like, 4.30 a.m., leaves the house, And to be quite honest with you, I know that, you know, people work differently in the morning, but usually it wouldn't take 10 minutes to leave the house. I think that that's very impressive. But this is the most impressive part of this entire thing is that it said, oh my God, it was like 8.30 a.m. or something like that. It said uh, Cam Newton takes his first sip of coffee. Now... If you are sipping your coffee after you've been awake for like three hours, uh, that is perplexing to me, okay? The first thing I do every single morning with my minor caffeine addiction, excuse me, is the fact that I wake up in the morning and I drink my coffee. That is the first thing I do every day. And I'm not trying to be like that quirky person that's like oh yeah coffee is like my thing you know I love coffee oh my god I just love coffee oh my god like that's not no I'm literally saying I can't function without it so the fact that he goes like three hours in his morning and not even waking up at like you know 8 a.m and getting to work at nine and then getting your coffee there no I'm talking about the fact that he wakes up at four something in the morning and doesn't drink his coffee until 8 30 that is perplexing to me. Cam, if you're listening, um, for a friend, I'm just asking, how do you deal with that? And can I get some insight on that? I would really, really appreciate it if you could tell me how to do that. So I had to just talk about this really quick. Um, again, we'll talk a little bit more about the Bills Patriots a little later, but, um, I hope that I I won't ramble on any longer about Cam Newton's routine. I hope that you guys enjoy that this interview with the Cross the Pond podcast. All right, everybody, today we are joined today by James Scott and Katie Brinkley of Across the Pond Podcast. You guys, thank you so much for coming on. I'm so excited to have you here. I am so excited to be here. Thanks for having me and James. Of course. Oh, thanks, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, James and Katie do the Across the Pond Podcast. Um, why don't you guys let everyone know where they can find it? Uh, I know that you guys just put up your website and your social media channels and all that good stuff. Uh, yeah, so we're pretty much all over. Um, we're on the website now, atpsports.net. You can 
catch all the information about us as hosts. Um, we've got a whole website. You can actually listen to the podcast on the website as well. Um, sometimes it's handy for people when they're at work and they're trying to ignore what they're trying to do, number crunching and stuff. <laughs> so they just listen to us instead. Um, and you can find us wherever you listen to podcasts um, and all your kind of normal social media feeds. So Facebook, Instagram, Across the Pond Sports Pod, and uh, on Twitter at, at ATP Sports Pod. Yeah, and, and obviously, as you guys can tell, James is from Scotland and Katie lives in Colorado. So all three of us are in different time zones right now. So it's really exciting that we were able to make this work. So to get into this, first things first, um, we have to deal with the breaking news of today. So today is Monday and Dwayne Haskins has officially been released by the Washington football team. I just want to know your guys' thoughts, uh, what you think of him, what you think of what happened, you know, last week with the whole strip club situation. You know, what, do you, what are you guys feeling about everything that's going on with Dwayne Haskins? Well, I'm going to let Katie take this one because Katie's like such a big fan of Dwayne. And <laughs> she, she's loved him since day one of our podcast. <laughs> yeah, if you guys are interested in hearing um, my my thoughts on Dwayne Haskins, feel free to start at, at episode one of or week one of the NFL um, because uh, that was our me and James first podcast together, and I really did not put it lightly as to how I felt about Dwayne Haskins as an NFL quarterback. Um, <laughs> I'm I'm not surprised that at all that he was benched I think that he probably has a, a serious attitude problem and um, that is part of the reason as to why he was consistently in the doghouse there in Washington um, but I mean 15th overall pick and they just let him go I mean that's crazy to me because you know how important it is to have a first round pick and how uh, valuable those those players typically are to an organization and to just release him, not even trade him or, or anything mm -hmm. to just release him is, is crazy to me. And it we've seen this twice you. as well. Yeah. This, we've seen this twice um, this year where a team has got rid of a star. I mean, I think Le'Veon Bell was a bigger star than uh, Haskins was for the right reasons. Um, and I think the, the Jets very much just threw him out the door, um, said on you go. Redskins? Or, uh, footballers, you mean? Yeah, um, where, where, whereas um, with Haskins, it is a strange one because he was a 15th pick. Um, and whenever you pick up a first round quarterback, you do tend to see them hang around at least a couple of years. Um, I mean, I suppose he's been there two years, but I think with you, you mean, you've got Alex Smith, who has had this amazing recovery and there's a really good feel good story to that. Uh, but. Yeah, Haskins was was turning the kind of feel good factor in Washington um, on its head, and yeah, the whole strip club thing. I mean, he's not the only one of uh, this week that's been in in, in a strip club. Um, James Harden's done the same uh, in Houston, but yeah, uh, th this is uh, it's never going to go well when you're trying to fight for your place and then you go and do something stupid like that. Well, yeah. I think I was just saying, I think too, like it'd be a different situation if Haskins had per somewhat produced on the field, right. but he failed to produce. And um, I mean, he was outplayed by a guy that they'd signed to the practice squad just, you know, <laughs> week before. So I think that that's kind of a, it goes to say that he's probably had too many distractions around him. Um, and he's only 23. I mean, hopefully he will, be able to bounce back and get some maturity and not end up like another Johnny Manziel. Um, but I, I think that it's, it's one of those things where like, I've never really had a ton of confidence in him as being a legitimate starter in this league. Um, mm -hmm. But it's, it's crazy. I still think it's crazy that he was just released and just, just cut, you know, because um, I think that obviously he had some serious uh, locker room chemistry problems with, with those around him. Yeah, absolutely. And and this whole thing, too, is so crazy because, like you're saying, it's obvious that there was an attitude problem there because if something like this happened and the guy was good and he was like, oh, I'm sorry about everything, like, they would have forgiven him. But Ron Rivera seems to be running a tight ship with this team and the fact that he hasn't produced and he really isn't all that great, just get rid of him at this point. And their backup is Heineke, which – 
is I I'm going to call him the beer quarterback because <laughs> that's a that's a beer for that's great. I first I thought his name was Heine and I was like, oh, dear God, this is not good. <laughs> but they said it was Heineke. But yeah, so this whole situation just blew my mind. Like when I saw that that got that dropped, I was like, this is probably the best move, I think, for Washington. It, it's there's nothing going on with him. And Alex Smith might not be the future and, and Heineke might not be the future. But now they have an opening to, you know, have somebody that they can bring in and hopefully be better. And I was also talking to my dad about this before when he was at Ohio State, Joe Burrow was benched for Dwayne Haskins and then Joe Burrow went to LSU and I was like that is that's something crazy that that this is the guy that basically made Joe Burrow leave Mm -hmm. one one thing too I mean like without getting too far down on this tan on this Mm -hmm. kind of a college football tangent but there's so many players especially at the quarterback position who are just electric in college football but then have a hard time making the transition over to NFL. Absolutely. And if you think about his style of play, you know, it definitely was is really well suited for college football yeah. um, where Joe Burrow, he's that pocket passer. He sits back there and is able to find the right reads. Um, so I think that that's, there's some guys that just have a hard time making the transition from college to NFL. And I, I think Haskins is one of them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. So I just wanted to like go over that really quick because that that news that broke today was insane. But let's get into um, NFL week 16. We're coming down to the wire here. We got eliminations going left and right. Who's losing? Who's winning? One of the biggest games from the Saturday uh, games that were going on was the Dolphins Raiders game that was at night. Now, the Raiders are no longer in They're eliminated from playoff contention the rate the sorry the dolphins are still in the mix here but there was a really really big thing that happened at the end there which was Tua was benched in the fourth quarter and ryan fitzpatrick came in and saved the day james what are your thoughts on the quarterback situation in miami right now and was this the right move and and what are you thinking about this i think it's the right move because they won and at the end of the day that's that's well, the aim of the game is, is to win. So um, Tua, for me, hasn't set the world on fire. Um, uh, some quarters have been calling for him to be named Offensive Rookie of the Year and all this kind of stuff. Um, I think given the lack of games he's played and the games he has played, he, he, hasn't, he hasn't been great. He hasn't made mistakes. That, that's probably the, the big positive that you can take from his appearances is he's really not made a lot of mistakes. Uh, but in terms of putting yards on, on the board, he's really not done it. Um, the Raiders, for me, have, their season started so so well. They beat the Chiefs. They, they, they were sailing. And for me, this was a bit of a shock that the Raiders lost. Um, because even with quarterback issues, uh, it seemed like Joe, John Gruden had a really good uh, defense. And I thought that might win it out. The Dolphins, though, I mean, Fitzpatrick, I think he was at the bathroom when <laughs> he was, <laughs> it was, uh, they were looking for him. They're like, oh, we need a, we need another quarterback. Where, where's, where's Fitzpatrick? Um, and they were like, oh, he's gone to the John. So yeah, it was, uh, it was a quick kind of, uh, oh no, man, need to get back on the field. So yeah, it, it was a strange one, but I think what we've seen all year is that the quarterback position in Miami has never been, 100% one person's, um, but it's never been a timeshare either. And I think the coach there needs, if he hasn't already spoken to these two guys, needs to sit down and, and maybe work out what is going on and when guys will come in and, and mm-hmm. switch around. Yeah, I think that you're right, James. It's it's a really interesting situation that we've never really seen in the NFL where basically um, – Fitzpatrick is the relief pitcher. He's the relief quarterback. He's been coming in to that fourth quarter position or fourth quarter role and just like, all right, well, Tua had his chance to just kind of keep things close and play in an NFL game, but let's go ahead and have you come in and win it. And it's, um, he's able to do it. He's, he's got that, that fits magic. And um, I think that it's, it's really interesting to see because like you, you said, we've never really, we've never really seen this type of timeshare 
happen between quarterbacks. Um, I think that it, it would be interesting to to just give the reins back to Fitzpatrick, um, especially during the playoffs. If they do make a playoff run, it will be his first time making the playoffs in his 16 year career. So I think it, I mean, like Tua has not done anything to really wow me. Um, I think that he's been okay, but it's not like Jalen Hurts or uh, like Joe Burrow or Justin Herbert. Like he hasn't come in and just dominated the position and, and the game he's still kind of making those growing pains. And like I said, they're still winning, but I don't really understand why they're, uh, why they're doing this timeshare, but it's, Hey, it's working. So. Yeah. And it's a weird situation for sure. And a lot of people are like, well, Fitzpatrick is in the future, so he can't start, but two is the future. So he's going to keep starting, but it seems like he can't finish his own games. And I like, yeah, it's great to have this guy that can, that can close it out for you. I, I like the idea of basically Fitz being this closer that comes in and finishes off these games for the Dolphins, but I just, I don't know how healthy it is. I think that his confidence, like you can't not start two and now because his confidence is going to go down and then, then you're going to want to start him again. And it's a little confusing, but yeah, they're winning, but definitely in the off season, you know, whether or not they make the playoffs and, go on a really good playoff run the off season they're definitely going to have to make clear like this is what we're going to do this is who's going to start and this is going to be the situation because ryan fitzpatrick is getting up there in age he's not going to be around forever so yeah, 16 years in the league is is a lot for a quarterback yeah. i mean it, yeah. especially you typically don't have a quarterback that lasts that long i mean quarterbacks are going a lot longer nowadays because of the protection that they've built around the position but yeah. it's uh i completely agree with you it it is a really weird um, situation that they, that they have there. And I'm, I'm curious to see, like, I think that he's two has only thrown, like he's consistently thrown for less than a hundred yards a game. I mean, he's never really had a breakout game of like passing or anything. So I am surprised that they, like, I remember when they made the switch where everyone was kind of like, why, why did mm-hmm. we make the switch from Fitzpatrick We're winning, but Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And do you guys think that, you know, say they end up making the wild card, do you see the Dolphins going on a decent playoff run or do you think it's going to be a one and done thing? Probably a one and done. I don't think they'll, I don't think they have the depth this year. Um, I think in a couple of years time, two has maybe grown a bit. Um, and those that offensive line is maybe a bit more settled with who's playing quarterback. Um, I, I think in a couple of years' time, they will have a decent playoff run. But I think for this year, I think a wild card is actually a, a good good season for them, given yeah. the issues that they've had. I, I I agree. I think that it's very possible for for them to. I think that they're probably going to make the playoffs. I just. You know, I don't, I feel like they could end up being like the Titans last year where teams kind of underestimate them and maybe they'll, they'll make it past the first round, but I don't see them in the AFC championship game by any means. Yeah, no, neither do I definitely not, but I think a solid run for the season for them. I mean, we've, we've never really given the Dolphins the benefit of the doubt. I think people have clustered them with the New York Jets in that division a bit and it's, you know, Bills or Patriots, but the Patriots aren't in it right now. And the Dolphins took that and, and decided to run with it. So I definitely, I agree. I don't know if they're going to make it to the championship or let alone the Super Bowl, but pretty good season for them. Pretty good season for yeah. them. And, and what, like, do you guys have a preference? Do you, would like, if you were in that situation, like James, would you rather have Tua or would you rather have Fitzpatrick for the, like an entire game? For an entire game, I, I'd, I'd probably take Fitzpatrick just because he is reliable um, mm-hmm. and he is experienced, whereas Tua just now when he comes on, I mean, Katie said it already, she, he, he's thrown for less than 100 yards in a couple of these games. So um, I, I think for production, you, you go for Fitzpatrick. Um, and, yeah, if you're – when I, I would actually do the opposite as to what Flores is doing. I would play Fitzpatrick for the three quarters, win the game in three quarters, and then bring Tua and let him have his uh, his key yeah. ring on for the fourth quarter. See, I think that you know maybe this is something that works for them, bringing you know 
Fitzpatrick in for that closer position. But uh, I mean, it's not to say that Tua hasn't had a great, a, a, an okay season. Um, it's not great. Like I said before, I think that it's, there's definitely room for him to grow. I just think that this is Fitzpatrick's time. He's been in the league for 16 years and let him have his chance to be a veteran out there. Uh, but again, the way that Flores has coached his team this year, I would not be surprised to see Tua starting for their for, for the playoffs. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I think that that's definitely what's going to end up happening if they end up making the wild card. But sticking within the AFC East here, like I mentioned before, we kind of usually group the Dolphins with the New York Jets, who have won another game for some reason. Um, <laughs> so the Jets came out with an incredible win, really over the Cleveland Browns. The Cleveland Browns looked god-awful. This wasn't the Cleveland Browns that we've been seeing the last couple weeks. This isn't the Cleveland Browns we saw versus Lamar Jackson and the Ravens on Monday Night Football putting up 42 points. So the Jets get this win. It is official that the Jacksonville Jaguars are going to have a number one pick. Katie, if this were you, if you were in the GM situation here, would you be happy would you be upset? Would you just be like, whatever? Like, what is your thoughts on the fact that the Jets just decided to start winning games at the end of the season and now well, have the number two pick? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I don't think like that. It couldn't be any more Jets than that. Like you guys have been terrible all year and now you're going to decide to start <laughs> winning games. It's, it's, it's one of those things where I'm just, uh, I don't understand why uh, Adam Gase was even brought back this year. I really don't. He is a terrible head coach, uh, but I've, we saw them continuing to be terrible. They spent all that money on the Damian. Um, I say it all the time, but I mean, Le'Veon Bell mm-hmm. spent all that money on him and then just let him walk away. I, I mean, there was so many bad GM and head coach and, and just bad football decisions being made in New York. And this is, this is one of them now winning at the end of the year. Um, it's not to say that Sam Darnold is, is not a, a good quarterback I think that Adam Gase is is the problem there in New York so I don't think it's terrible that they don't have the number one pick because Mm. I I don't know I mean like maybe Sam Darnold just needs a better coach um and Trevor Lawrence really I mean why have two good quarterbacks unless they wanted to trade Darnold they're they're not going to have the number one pick now I just think it's it, you can't get more jets than this. Like you guys have <laughs> not been making smart football decisions all year. So of course you're going to start winning in week 15. Um, I do feel bad for the Browns because, you know, they basically had no receivers out there and mm-hmm. uh, they, they basically had the same situation that the Broncos had a few weeks ago when all of the Broncos quarterbacks got on the uh, hot, close contact COVID list. So they couldn't play. So then they were stuck playing, you know, the, their, practice squad wide receiver at quarterback that's Mm -hmm. basically what happened to the Browns on Sunday is they had no wide receivers like all of their wide receivers were in close contact with somebody so they didn't have anyone and as as good as the the two-headed monster of Kareem Hunt and and Nick Chubb is you know you have to have someone to to throw the ball to and um they're their offensive line had struggles so it it was it was a rough game for, for the Browns and when I saw that they were going to be missing all their wide receivers. I was like, Ooh, this is a game that the Jets actually probably could win. And they did. Mm-hmm. So one of my friends had a, a bet on, I think from week two that the Jets would go winless and um, throughout the season. Um, and he, he actually predicted to me uh, that the Browns would probably screw that up. Now, Obviously, it got screwed up last week, so it was absolutely fine. So he wasn't too too upset when the Browns won this week, uh, or the Browns lost this week, sorry. But Katie's exactly right. Uh, when I seen that there was no wide receivers, um, a run game, I mean, me and Katie have talked about this all season long as well. Um, teams that win have a run game and a receiving uh, game. And when you take one away, especially from a team that have done so well without Odell Beckham Jr., Mm-hmm. Um, at wide receiver, you know, they've Landry's come in and, and been an absolute star for them. So the Jets winning uh, is a shock, but at the same time, I think 
they won last week and they pretty much, the, the, the writing was on the wall that they were going to lose the number one pick to the Jaguars anyway. So why not just win a couple of games? Um, I'm pretty sure Roger Goodell put up a, put in a call to, to the Jets ownership saying, well, you've won one now. So, you you know, you might as well let these guys off the reins and, and let yeah. them see what they can do. So, um it's a tough one. If I was, if I'm a Jets fan, yeah, I'm pretty annoyed because you've went through a whole season of, you know, losing, losing, losing. Um, I think you had Jaguar fans cheering on the Bears um, at their game. So I mean, you can see how much the number one pick means to teams um, when you're cheering on your opposition that Sunday. Uh, so nah, I think I think the Jets they've got Sam Darnold, and and like Kate says, Sam Darnold's probably not the issue. The issue is Adam Gaze, and I think you get rid of Adam Gaze and you bring in a semi-decent coach, then things might turn around in, in New York for the Jets, that is. Yeah, I, I totally agree with both of you because I kind of had that thought too. I'm like, well, you know, number one in the draft, you kind of like, it would be stupid of you to pass up Trevor Lawrence, but also like maybe the number two pick isn't so bad for the Jets. <laughs> I don't th- like a lot of people are like, oh, yeah, they'll they'll take a, the, the next best quarterback. You know, people are talking about Justin Fields and things. I'm like, I wouldn't even bother, like get like the top tier wide receiver or something for you, like something that Sam Darnold can throw to. Because we've seen over the past couple of weeks and throughout this season, really, Sam Darnold's got an arm. He can chuck it down the field if if, you know, the right play calling and all that good stuff. Sam Darnold's really not that bad of a quarterback. They had a really great trick play in that game that that resulted, I think, in a touchdown um, or at least on the goal line. Yeah, I think – I mean, like, I feel like Sam Darnold has not been the problem. I mean, like, they're – as Sam – as James puts it out there, they're running around with 100 and – what do you say, 106-year-old Frank Gore as their lead (laughs) rusher. You know, I mean, like, I mean, there's, there's just been questionable coaching decisions each week and I mean you start trying to use your those younger guys that at running back see how they are for next year because if they're not very good you can draft one I mean like they're Mm -hmm. they're making so many questionable coaching calls um I don't think that Sam Darnold is the problem I think that there's they they let Robbie Anderson walk away for for nothing and, and you see how well he's doing in Carolina there's just been a lot of bad decisions there in New York. And I think that that's the, that's one of the biggest issues. Um, it's not Sam Darnold's problem. And I think that you know, Trevor Lawrence might honestly not have been the, the best fit for, for that team. Cause there's so many other problems that they have. Yeah. I think if anything, Jacksonville could use a new quarterback, you know, Minshew's not really doing the mania that he was doing last year. Uh, Mike Glennon, you know, not a future quarterback, I would think so maybe it was meant to be maybe this is the best place for trevor lawrence and i i don't know but if you so like say let's say the jets end up not drafting another quarterback james do you think that there's a future for sam darnold in this league and do you think it's with the jets do you think that they'll get rid of him anyway like what do you think is going to go on with sam darnold i think sam darnold's a, a pretty good quarterback and i think like he alluded to there yeah um given the right coaching uh, and the right playbook then I actually think he could be pretty decent um he's definitely a starting quarterback he's not like a backup or anything he's definitely a kind of solid starting quarterback he's got a good arm on him and he can sling it so um and it comes down to decision making and, and the playbook that he has and what he's working from just now it looks like it's been written on the back of a napkin so uh, I'm hoping that either Gaze goes or Sam Donald just says look trade me wave me whatever because I mean if you don't have to go to a strip club I'll go to a strip club and you can just wave me that way so um whatever I think he'll do whatever he can to to get out of of New York mm-hmm. yeah Kate I mean Katie you, you touched on it before but do you think that there's a future for Sam Darnold yeah I do I, I really do I mean there was a reason that he was a first round draft pick and I don't think it's it, I think he's a lot better of a quarterback than Josh Rosen um and I just think he needs he needs to have uh, the the right coach and, and team uh, assembled around him. Uh, 
I, I think that there's there's definitely going to be a chance for him. I like the fact that he is, he reminds me a lot of like Eli Manning. So kind of like the personality of a wet sponge, but, a, you know, he'll go out there, which I mean, like, I feel like you kind of need to have if you're a quarterback or, a, you know, a popular position player in a big market like New York. And you can you, I mean, can you imagine if like Dwayne Haskins was the quarterback there? I mean, there's there's a reason why certain like markets I feel like having a, a quarterback that doesn't have a huge personality is great because then they they're just like yeah whatever man you know I'm, I'm just gonna go out there and play football they're mm-hmm. not like out there trying to get all the the flash bulbs you know on them so I think that I think it I would stick with him for another another year and um you know try and get some better players around him and and really see what he can do before I throw throwing the towel on him I mean hey we'll take him here in Denver I'll take Sam (laughs) yeah we're we're gonna talk about Denver a little later because I I do want to talk to you about that but before we get into that so I I'm we're gonna stick within the AFC for just a little bit longer and I want to talk about the Steelers really quick because obviously Steelers came out with a really big win over the Colts yesterday, which I think a lot of people weren't expecting over, you know, over the past few weeks, we've seen the Steelers in, on a bit of a decline and the Steelers look like they showed up yesterday to get this win over the Colts. And, you know, now they are officially um, the winners of the AFC North, which a lot of people were thinking, Oh, it might not happen. The Browns are coming up. The Ravens are still doing well. So they, there was still um, a little bit of weirdness going on there. Um, James, do you think that we saw a better Steelers team yesterday, or do you think that it was, you know, the Colts maybe did not as well? What what are you thinking? I think the Steelers, um, we mentioned earlier, if you don't have a running game and a passing game, then then you kind of make a rod for your own back. Um, I don't think the Steelers have had a particularly good run game all season long, um, but Big Ben has managed to find his guys. Um, Claypool has been outstanding. Schuster, when he's not dancing around on logos, has been pretty good. So, um, he, I think, uh, I think the last couple of weeks have been a bit more of a reality check for the Steelers and, and Mike Tomlin. Um, certainly, from what you see online, um, the, the two of those guys have, have taken a bit of a tanking online. Um, people calling for their heads. Um, I think that's a bit premature. Um, and I think this game showed that that was premature because I think the Steelers licked their wounds a little and got back onto the field and, and beat a really good Colts team, which has had a great season. Yeah, Katie, what I about think, you? I, as I say, I think that it's crazy to me that the, the, the Steelers, they, they obviously had a, a fire lit under them um, at halftime because, I mean, I think it was 24 to, to 7 um in the in the third quarter uh, with the Colts winning and I think that this is where Ben Roethlisberger stepped up and said okay guys and and showed his veteran status and his leadership by trying to rally his team around him because let's be real there has been zero running game from the Steelers these past four weeks I think this last week too James Conner only had like 20 yards or something so I think that this is that's a huge problem problem for them going into the playoffs is they have to find that running game again because it, it's completely disappeared. And Ben Roethlisberger, though, was like, look, let's win. You know, we started this season, you know, just, just three weeks ago, we were undefeated. Let's go back to our winning ways. Let's win the AFC North and just just shut this team out. And, and they were able to do that. And I, uh, I think it ended up being a really good momentum driver. I think that they'll probably take this. I, I think – I mean, you know, Mike, Mike Tomlin has not asked me, but I think that if I were Mike Tomlin, I would start all of my starters in week 17 against the Browns because they, th- this, this momentum has to take them into the playoffs. They have to keep it up because um, coming from behind down, like I said, 24 to, to seven is, and, and rallying back and winning. If they just sit all their starters, I could see them coming out in, you know, the first week of the playoffs and, being stagnant and um, potentially losing a very winnable game. Yeah. And I think next week, even though, you know, the Browns just lost, but the Browns are still a very scary team. And I think that the Steelers still have to make sure, because I think if the Browns get this, a win next week, I believe that they get the wild card. So Mm -hmm. 
you know, they, they, they can't just take this game like, you know, it was nothing. So it's definitely going to be important. Um, in terms of the playoffs, you know, James, are you thinking that if, you know, the, the Steelers are going, will they make it something special? Are they going to make it interesting? Are they going to be, you know, are we going to see this team that we've seen the last few weeks just completely disintegrate? You know, I, I, I don't know about this Steelers team in the, in the playoffs. I think people have had a question over the Steelers all season long uh, simply because of the the run game or the lack of. And it, it did get shown up in the last few weeks and it has been shown up all, all year. But what they've won off is the back of Ben finding his guys and Mike Tomlin coming up with some great plays um, that really kind of play to that strength. So Mike Tomlin has played very much the strengths the Steelers have. He knows they don't have a great run game. So he's setting up his team up to win through passing. And I, I don't think that wins you a Super Bowl. Um, and I think it, it is a real struggle in the playoffs um, if you don't have a run game. Because the playoffs are a, a totally different animal to, to regular season games. So, I mean, I know there still won't be crowds and stuff like that. But at the end of the game, there's still going to be quite a, a level of intensity that, you're really going to need to go into these games with. And I, I think the Steelers are going to struggle in the playoffs. Yeah. Katie. Yeah. I can see them struggling too, if they can't figure out this running game situation. I mean, like, like I said, James Con they've, they've had less than I think 50 yards for the past four weeks. And that's a serious problem. You can't just be a one dimension dimensional team and expect to go very far in the playoffs. So um they need to get that figured out. And uh, the Colts, I mean, they're, it, they're definitely still hanging on for life with playoff hopes. Um, I think that, you know, they, they play the Jaguars again, who um, they lost to in, in week one. I mean, the Jaguars haven't won since, <laughs> since beating the Colts. So, I mean, I think it'd be the stupidest thing ever for, for them to, to win this game. But, hey, you know, the Jets did started winning games. So, who knows? Uh, but I think that – the Colts uh, are desperately going to desperately going to be be wanting to win and yeah yeah because they can I think if the Titans lose and the Colts win I think they they get that their division it's, mm -hmm. it's so funny around this time of year when you're just like okay this is everything that needs to happen this team needs to win this team needs to lose this is what needs to happen it gets so complicated but once everything smooths out we have a very exciting playoff run and now that we have our new playoff you know um almost layout because now we are getting two wild card teams so that's i think going to be super exciting um for us in terms of entertainment but let's let's head over to to the teams that you guys like and i want to start out with james's team because um obviously as many people know i'm a giants fan james happens to be a cowboys fan and how about them Cowboys? They came out this week with a outrageous win. I don't I like I don't think anybody thought the Cowboys had a shot in this game with the Eagles and their new offense with Jalen Hurts. So James, what was your impression of your, of your Cowboys team this week? I mean, obviously they put up a good amount of points and did some really great things on offense. So what what were your thoughts on your Cowboys this week? Well, I was just say, hold just... on, before you answer that, James, oh. I think that you need to uh, also say what your thoughts are on Ezekiel Elliott, because you were pretty hard on yes. him on our show. Um, you, you said that if, if, if Zeke played, I think you said if Zeke played, that they were going to lose, and you'd rather that he did not play. Um, I, I think that Zeke ended up averaging over five and a half yards of carry on this. So, so yeah, I'm curious to know uh, <laughs> how, how you feel about Zeke and your Cowboys. Oh, wow, anyone see that bus just fly by? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I did. I will own up and say that I uh, slated Zeke Elliott. <clears throat> However, that wasn't the first week <laughs> I've slated him. Um, he has earned a lot of money this year and hasn't really earned it uh, for my money. Um, I did, by the way, have the Cowboys winning this game. Um, I thought they'd win by six. Um, so I was, I was, I was quietly confident they'd win. I thought. Jalen Hurts, and I think the point I made was usually by the third game, third start um, for a, a quarterback, a rookie quarterback, is usually when they, they have some issues because teams have seen some real tape on them in real games. Um, and I think this is what happened. I think Hurts didn't 
have the greatest of games. Um, I think that the Cowboys just kind of came out and did what they needed to do, um, which was put in a good performance because I think all Cowboys fans this season have been fairly frustrated. I mean, even when, before Dak Prescott got injured, it, you know, people were frustrated with Ezekiel Elliott. So um, it, it was good to see him play well. Uh, and I hope it's not just a flash in the pan and I hope he can, he can kind of build on that. Maybe it gives him confidence. Um, I don't know, but maybe the week off that he had has done the world of good. He's got over his injury. And, and I think because a few weeks ago, I did say, is he injured? Because he'd been playing. So you, you don't see a star running back go from a star running back to absolutely nothing the next year. Mm-hmm. So for, without some kind of reasoning, um, so I, I hope now that this is him turned the corner and, you know, we can beat the Giants this weekend and uh, move <laughs> on to the playoffs. Katie, what, what did you think from an outsider's point of view? What did you think of the Cowboys yesterday? I was very excited for James. I, I watched, <laughs> I, there was so many highlights on Red Zone and, uh, you know, so many, you know, deep balls being thrown and wide receivers. I think that Amari Cooper and C.D. Lamb both had over like 120 or 115 yards receiving. And like, this is exciting for for Cowboys fans um, because this was a season that really there, there was a lot of hype over for them. And there's a lot of reasons why they should have a much better record than they do. But for some reason, they just were kind of stuck in reverse and, and in neutral all season. So I'm I was really excited for James that, that his Cowboys were doing so good. Um, I p- picked up Jalen Hurts on my fantasy team. So I was a little frustrated by that. But at the same time, I was like, well, I mean, they're down by so much. He's going to have to throw the ball more. So, um, mm-hmm. but yeah, I, I think that that's exactly it with what happened with, with Hurts this week is, you know, with, with three, this is his third game as a starter. Teams have tape on him now and know kind of what, what his tendencies are and what, you know, what some of his handicaps are. So I think that that's one of the biggest reasons why we saw him uh, struggle a little bit. I mean, he still had over 300 passing yards and uh, almost, I think almost a hundred yards rushing. So I think that he still had, you know, didn't have a terrible game by any means, but it, they came out and everyone on that Cowboys offense was, was clicking and it looked like the, the Eagles defense just forgot to show up. Yeah, yeah, that's what that was definitely going to be my next question is, well, James, what do you think of um, Jalen Hurts performance? Do you think that he did worse this week? Do you think that it was just kind of a fluke like, the, you know, the Eagles defense? Well, I think the Eagles defense is uh, at the beginning of the season, they really struggled and mm-hmm. they didn't show up at the beginning of the season. It, it, it took a, a while for them to get going. So um, and I think maybe now that we're at the end of the season, they've maybe felt the same um hurts for me did okay he wasn't he wasn't he played badly um he just didn't he just, he just wasn't as explosive as he was the last couple of weeks so well he um, was always trying to play catch up i mean yeah, it yeah. was it was 17 to or 20 to 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 i don't know 20 to 17 i guess i don't know maybe it wasn't weren't playing catch up they just didn't come out in the second half at all like they're it was a weird game for, for the Eagles because I think that they they were just completely outmatched by every every Cowboys receiver. They they had no answer for any Cowboys receiver that game. Yeah, they were definitely like a, a step or two off. Um and, and that can be all the difference um between a, a, a reception um and a an incompletion. So I just don't think, I think very much like the beginning of the season, the Eagles defense took a long time to get going. Once they did get going, they, they seemed to be fine. They're picking up wins and um, Hertz has come in and, and they've done really well for him. But then, yeah, they, we, we seem to potentially maybe be seeing a bit more of a slide from them again. Maybe they thought, oh, Hertz is here now so we can take our foot off the gas a bit. And maybe they're tired because they've had to work under Wentz for the whole season. So, um I'd make anyone tired really <laughs> yeah the, the Eagles team I think that you know they they did okay and I think that Jalen Hurts still gave his all I mean we saw that you know De, uh, Deshaun Jackson came back in this game and we saw that beautiful 81 yard touchdown to Deshaun Jackson who then 
you know, flipped into the end zone, which I absolutely hate. I hate when they do that because it gives me anxiety because I'm like, oh my God, don't do that. But that's a whole, that's a whole other thing, a whole other <laughs> thought process. But, um, <laughs> but in terms of the Eagles, yeah, I, I was expecting a little bit more, but Jalen Hurts, I still think did fairly well. And I, I agree with you guys that these Cowboys receivers stepped it up. I mean, we saw CD lamb out here doing some great things and, you know, he was a pretty high draft pick for the Cowboys. And I was like, not really seeing all that much from him this season, but he's definitely started to get his groove and, and everything. And same thing with Zeke. Yeah. Lamb said flashes. Like he's, he's done yeah. well at times, but he's never really been consistent. So I think maybe that hopefully this isn't another one of these ones where he just kind of shows a bit of brilliance and then hides on the sideline for a while. And hopefully this gives him a bit of confidence so he can kind of go out and do this every week. Yeah. Yeah. And definitely the run game as well. I mean, I, I think I said the same thing as you, James, was that I was like, Oh, if Zeke plays, I don't see them doing that. Well, he drops balls left and right. So I think I, I said that too, to, to be on your side <laughs> with all that. But uh, since they are playing the Cowboys, uh, I'm sorry, the Giants next week, uh, what are your thoughts? Since if, if Washington loses, it's up to either, you know, Giants or Cowboys. So, you know, we're, we're foes in this situation for next week. But uh, do you think that the, that the Cowboys can do it? Because I'm going to be really honest with you. I'm not feeling too, too hot about my Giants. I don't know why, but I don't, I'm not feeling too good about it. I think the Giants, uh, and I've, I'll be honest, I've said this for a number of weeks now, uh, probably since about week eight, is that the Giants have impressed me so much because although they lost Barkley, they lost a bunch of other players uh, from injury, big key players. Uh, and, you know, you've got Daniel Jones who's, who's trying to do too much. But I, I think they've really put in an effort in every game to try and win games. And some of the games that they've played, although they might not have won, have been really close. Um, I think this weekend against the Cowboys will be really close. Um, I think it will be tight because I will, I, I do think that the Giants will put in that effort um, and they won't want to go out to the Cowboys because it's a divisional game. So, um, but I, I do think the Cowboys are going to win if, and only if the Cowboys can play the same way um, against the Giants as they did against the Eagles at the weekend. Yeah, and Katie, as, as an outsider, Talit, what, what do you think? I think a lot of it's going to depend on if, if Daniel Jones is playing. I, mm-hmm. I really do. I think that he, when he's out there, like it, it can be a fault of his. I think that sometimes he tries to do it all himself to win the game. But, I mean, it that can be a fault uh, because then you're – you know, tripping over your own shoelaces when you're, there's no one around you and, you know, when you're up a 80 yard run to, to the end zone and no one tackles you, but you. Um, so I think that that can't be a fault uh, trying to win the game yourself. I didn't even bring that up. Um, <laughs> it's okay. But, uh, but I think that that's one of the things where uh, he plays with so much heart mm-hmm. and that's one of the things, you know, he he's out there and he wants to win and, He'll try and kind of do too much, but um, the guy wants to win. And when he's out there, that, that can be a difference maker. So Daniel Jones is, is healthy enough to play. I, I could see the, the Giants winning this. And I think that if the Giants win and Washington wins, then the Giants will win the NFC East. But if the Cowboys win, then the Cowboys win the NFC East, right? Yeah, I know. I think, I think Washington has to lose. If Washington okay. wins, they win the division. So – we need okay. to lose. Okay. <laughs> but I mean, regardless of that, I think that even if, you know, even if Washington ends up winning, which I think they just flexed Washington and Philadelphia to Sunday night next week. So uh, we won't know, you know, whoever wins, you know, could just, they could have just won the last game of the season and, and not have any playoff implications at all. So we won't know until the end of the night on Sunday, but um yeah, I, I, that's the thing I love about Daniel Jones is he does have a lot of heart and we've seen him do some great things, even if he does trip over his own two feet. I mean, I, it's, that was one of my favorite things to see from him that that game. I was like, look at him go. I didn't even know he could do that. It was so, <laughs> it was, I was almost like a proud, it was like a proud moment for me to see Daniel Jones running that much. But yeah, I, I think that 
we definitely need to work on our offensive coordinator situation because I don't know if, you know, um, <laughs> James, like, I don't know how you feel about Jason Garrett, but I've hated him my whole him. life. Keep him? Yeah, no, we don't want him anymore. <laughs> I don't want him anymore. I didn't want him to begin with. I was like, I've been hating this man my whole life. How can I have him on my team now? But regardless, <laughs> it's, um, yeah. I, I think, well, I think that in the for the Giants, I think that um, I wouldn't get rid of Jason Garrett just yet. I think that maybe when they have Saquon <laughs> Barkley back there. No, seriously. I think, I mean, not that Saquon yeah, Barkley is the entire can... offense. Uh, the entire offense I think that I think that give the guy another chance I mean we saw what he did with Zeke and Zeke I mean like if he has one of those elite rushers I think that I I wouldn't count the guy out I mean I'm not a huge you know Cow, Cowboys fan or Jason Garrett fan by any means but I definitely think, think that he's a better offensive coordinator or, or you know coach than Adam Gase is um I I would take Adam I would I would take Jason Garrett for our for the Broncos uh, <laughs> offensive coordinator position. I mean, like there's been a lot of struggles. I think that he's done what he's could when you lose a guy like Saquon Parkley and you really don't have a plan B mm-hmm. that's they've kind of been put behind the eight ball. And the fact that they're still in the running for the NFC East is it does say a lot. And I mean, they've been without their starting quarterback, so can't fi- rule the guy out just yet. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think that's just like the piece in the back of my mind. That's just like you have to still hate him. You don't like him. But regardless of the fact, I mean, I I think that it's going to be a good game. I think it's definitely going to be competitive because of the fact that the Cowboys and the Giants really are on the same level in terms of, you know, the way that they're playing. So I think it's definitely going to be good and it's it's going to come down to the wire, but I am scared. I am very scared and Again, we won't even know if even if we win the game, the the Washington football team could win later on and it could be all for nothing. But either way, we've talked a lot about me and James's team. Katie, I want to talk about your team, the Denver Broncos, for a little while. They- we, don't need to. we don't need to. That's fine. We can just end the show now. This is fine. No, 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 no. We, we're going to talk about this. Now let's definitely talk about those Broncos. <laughs> So obviously, unfortunately, they they came up with a loss. Um, very close game, though. Very close. Like, I'm going to be honest with you. I I was um, doing some stuff on my computer and things during the later games, and I happened to just glance up watching Renzo, and then all of a sudden it was 16-16, and the Broncos made their way back up. I was like, that's this is impressive. Uh, now it's coming down to a tiebreaker within the last two minutes of the game. So... I'm I'm curious, Katie, on what your thoughts are in terms of Drew Locke and your head coaching situation and things like that. Because, you know, while while they are not the worst, I don't I think that they can definitely improve. What do you think? Well, I think that Drew, I, I would love it if um, I I was reading a couple uh, articles on the Athletic over the weekend, and one of them was the Broncos making a push for Marcus Mariota this off season, oh. and. I think that would be a fantastic push because there's a guy that is going to uh, challenge Drew Locke. I think that Drew Locke needs some competition. He's, he's made a lot of bad decisions. And I think that if they sign a veteran quarterback early enough to, to kind of push him in this off season, hopefully he'll take that time to really sit down and focus and try and work on his growth. And if you have a quarterback competition, I think that that's mm-hmm. going to be really good for him. He is, he makes a lot of bad decisions, Drew Locke. Um, I don't think, I think that Vic Fangio should get one more year. He had a lot of injuries this year and COVID. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, there's a num- I mean, with the exception of Adam Gase, I, <laughs> I think that just about every coach should get another chance next year because COVID COVID. threw a lot of curveballs uh, their way to try and overcome and, and challenges to overcome. And he's Vic Fangio has made some questionable timeout calls and non-calls. But other than that, I think that he has his defense playing good. He's got a lot of uh, young talent on that team. Um, the biggest problem that we have is, is at quarterback. And I don't think that I like that. I don't think that Drew Locke is, is the answer. Maybe if he gets, uh, a strong quarterback competition uh, this off season that that will really help him. But there's, there's been a lot of poor decisions made by, by Drew Locke. 
Yeah, and James, do you have any thoughts on the on the Denver Broncos and Drew Locke? So, so I think the Broncos have had, uh, and uh, much like the 49ers, have been injury ravaged and mm. COVID and everything else. So I think they've been particularly unlucky. Um, Von Miller went down. I mean, that, that was a big part of their defence. Um, and a lot of, in fact, the rest of their defence probably didn't fare too well uh, with injuries as well. So I think it has been one of those seasons for the Broncos and a few other teams where injuries have just played a massive part in how their, their season's played out. And I think Drew Locke hasn't been great. Um, but I think there's been a lot of inconsistencies in terms of who he's playing with, who who's around him. And I don't think that's easy for a young quarterback trying to find his way in the league. Um, even if you talk about Sam Darnold, um, he, he's maybe in a, not as He's in a worse situation with the Jets, but he's at the same time had this, oh, who's around me this week? So, um, and I think Drew Locke's probably suffered a little bit of that. Although I do think the coach is slightly better um, than Adam Gaze. So um, I, for me, I think they, they need to give this team another chance. Yes, draft someone um, for Locke rather than against Locke um, and, and maybe trade to, to bring someone in. Um, mm-hmm. to give them that competition. But I think we, we've seen with Green Bay what happened when they drafted a quarterback. It made that um, resident quarterback a little bit angry. Um, I don't think that would happen with, with Drew Locke because I don't think he's Aaron Rodgers and I don't think he can. he's in a position to be able to well, get angry. The best situation that I think I would compare it to is the Drew Brees and Phillip Rivers situation back when it, San Diego, mm-hmm. because if you remember, like, there's a lot of questions around Drew Brees, like, oh, gosh, is he any good? Da, 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 da. He's not really playing that good. Let's go ahead and draft a quarterback. And that's when they drafted Phillip Rivers. Mm-hmm. And that was one of the best seasons that Drew Brees has had, um, one of the best seasons of his career. And he, they're kind of like, oh, great. Now we have a first round draft pick and Phillip Rivers. And uh, now our quarterback's doing great. Luck- I mean, luckily, they didn't have to make a decision because the next year Drew Brees hurt his arm and he just walked away and ended up in New Orleans. But look at how things have panned out for both of them. So I think that right. when there is a strong quarterback competition, especially in, if you have enough time in the offseason as the veteran or as the, the standing quarterback for the team, it gives you time to really that's your decision maker. It's like, okay, am I going to win this? Am I going to win this position? Am I going to be the guy next year? I'm going to study and work my butt off to be the guy. And Mm -hmm. um, I think that that, that's exactly what Drew Locke needs is is someone to come in and and push him because he doesn't have that right now. Yeah. And I definitely think that's something we've seen this season with someone like Aaron Rodgers, who, you know, he'll come out and and deny, deny, deny. But I, I like, you can't, you can't see that your coach and your team drafts a quarterback under you and you not think that they're thinking when you're gone or, or when you do bad. So I think that that'll definitely light a fire under you. And there's the comparison there with Carson Wentz, who obviously was freaking out at the fact that they drafted Jalen hurts. And it's, it all depends on your mentality as a quarterback. You know, if, if drew Locke, you know, say if they get someone like Marcus Mariota come in, if Drew Locke is one of these, you know, really hard-headed guys and the, he's like, oh, no, like, I'm the guy, I'm the guy, and then doesn't do anything about it, that just kind of goes to show what kind of character you have as well. So I think that that's, that's a really good plan for Denver. And, and I think I agree with you, too, that apart from Adam Gase, coaches this year have to deal with so much that it's like, how can you fire someone apart from going, you know, almost – you know, in 16, that you, and yeah, I, you couldn't I think, even do that right. <laughs> yeah, Adam Gase, you couldn't even do that right. You can't even tank right. <laughs> so dumb. But I think also Doug Marone, uh, the Jacksonville Jaguars head coach, might also be under a little bit of scrutiny, but at least he didn't mess it up and he, they have the first pick. <laughs> but um, on the other side of the ball here, we had the Chargers and I think I might have mentioned it to you guys last time when we when I did your episode is I'm a big Justin Herbert person. I think he is fantastic. I think he should win Offensive Rookie of the Year. And he broke a record last night. He is the most touchdowns in a rookie season in NFL history. 28 touchdowns in a rookie season, which is very impressive. So what are your thoughts, James, on Justin Herbert and his season so far, despite the Chargers obviously not having 
the best record. What are your thoughts on Justin Herbert's, you know, whole performance throughout the season? I think for me, um, obviously it was a bit of a weird situation that he came into right. um, where um, the, the team doctor punctured the lung of the, the resident quarterback um, and, and he kind of got 10 seconds and by the way, you're playing. So, yeah. um, but I think he dealt with that really well. Um, he went on and, you know, I think sports, professional sports is all about taking your chances and I think he's taken his chance this year and, and just showing what he can do and I think the Chargers now have themselves a franchise quarterback um, out of nothing. I mean, they, they probably weren't expecting him to to be that, but I mean, they knew when he, he got drafted, he was decent and he was he was going to be pretty good, but they mm-hmm. probably didn't think he was going to be quite this good, breaking records and everything else. So um, I've been big on him all year. So is Katie. Um, it's, it's something that we both agreed on um, and definitely offensive um, rookie of the year for, for me. Yeah, yeah, me too. Yeah, he's he's played lights out. Um, I mean, he's playing there like up there with like Andrew Luck and you know some of the some of the best quarterbacks that we've seen come out uh, in a long time. I think that it would have been interesting to see how the season went for the for the NFL Rookie of the Year if Joe Burrow hadn't gotten injured because mm-hmm. Joe Burrow was playing lights out too. I mean, his team wasn't winning. Um, not that, you know, the, the Chargers are sitting at, what, like six and nine. So I think that it's not like they're going to the playoffs or anything, but they're both, both these guys were having just standout seasons um, where they came out and showed that they were ready to play in the NFL. And I don't think really, I, I didn't expect him to be this ready um, coming out of Oregon. Cause I know that they, there was a lot of scouts that said that he had accuracy issues and um, he didn't have you know, a lot of leadership skills, but I mean, he's, he's, we, we saw him what, two weeks ago when he had that diving lunge into the end zone and yep. he, he does play with a lot of heart. And I think that um, he's just going out there and getting the job done. And that's, that's a great, <laughs> great leadership skill to have is just to be like, all right, guys, let's go out there and win. Um, so he's uh He's he's impressed me, and I I think that absolutely he should he should get the rookie of the year, um, award. Yeah, I, I I really have just loved watching him play throughout this whole year, and I I was so upset when people were talking about him before they drafted him. They were like, oh, he's too quiet, or he's you know not going to be a leader, and he's not going to be good in this league. And I'm like, like that's that's so messed up to say like, oh, he doesn't talk that much, so he can't be a good quarterback, like. People can learn. People can learn. And they even worked on it when the when the Chargers um, drafted him. And I think I don't know if you guys watched Hard Knocks this year on HBO, but the the Chargers and the Rams were on Hard Knocks this year and they were showing the behind the scenes. They're like, we're working on Justin's cadence. We're working on him getting it, projecting his voice. And I think he took all that into consideration and has put up a great season. And I like to say everything happens for a reason. I feel so bad for Tyrod Taylor so much. He's the second time in his career that he's lost his job to a rookie because of an injury first time being in Cleveland with, with Baker. So I, I definitely feel for the guy, but I guess he'll yeah, find maybe that's his... a guy that the Broncos can bring in, but I mean, like that's, a, <laughs> well, if, but that's the thing too. Like, I think that they need to bring like, not that Tyrod Taylor is not a good quarterback. I think that he is a, a good quarterback, but I really think that they, the, going back to the Broncos and on this, I think that they really need to bring in, a veteran that uh, still has still wants to prove something and uh, is going to give it their all and will really fight for that starting position. So um, here Cam Newton's going to be available. I am sure Cam Newton will be available and he (laughs) will not want to be in a quarterback (laughs) battle. I can guarantee you of that because he is, I feel like he has got way too much pride to be (laughs) in (laughs) sitting as a backup potentially anywhere. Yeah, I mean, do you guys do you guys think that Cam's going to end up anywhere next year? Like at all? Not unless he's not unless he's going gets like some kind of guarantee that he's going to get to start. Because like Katie said, he's he's not. Yeah. The ego um, definitely cashes checks that uh, the play can't make. So um, I think unless he's guaranteed to start somewhere, he's he's probably out of the league. Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, I, I always thought it was strange that um, 
Ron Rivera brought in Kyle Allen instead of him to Washington. But if the position is open in Washington, maybe Ron Rivera will snatch him up and they've worked together for so many years and they went to the Super Bowl together. They, they lost, but, you know. I maybe. think that Cam Newton is, he's, he's taken too many big hits. I really think that yeah. he's taken, I mean, like, because if you think about it, like he's taken some monster hits and hits that Tom Brady or, or Drew Brees or any of these guys would never take. And granted, he's a big dude. So you have to hit him harder to get him down. But like, he's taken some hits that like tight, like tight end, like Rob Gronkowski kind of hits. And um, I think it's messed with him. And he's, he's not throwing the ball the way he used to. He's not running the ball the way that he used to. I mean, yeah, he can do the, like inside the five yard line, he's going to try and run it in all three times if, if possible. But I think that that's, that's about his running abilities. Now it's, it's really too bad for me. Not that I've ever been a huge Cam Newton fan, but mm-hmm. I think that he's uh, he was really exciting to watch. He brought an entirely different level of football to the to the quarterback position, and um, unfortunately, the hits I, I think have finally caught up with him. Yeah, yeah, and to be and to um, go off on a bit of a tangent here, but I I was I'm so nervous for Lamar Jackson because Lamar Jackson really reminds me of Cam Newton a lot and you know they're both very mobile quarterbacks they run a lot and Lamar I think runs even more than Cam did in his you know in his big prime days but I'm so afraid that something's going to happen to Lamar where he's going to get hit and taken to the ground because he's you know he's doing his running and and everything and he's going to get severely injured and either end his career or you know give him a year off or or whatever might happen but I'm so nervous for Lamar in terms of he's so great right now. And you like, you know, it all it's going to come to an end at some point, but I really hope that it's not because of some drastic injury. Like, like Cam has had more than one, more than one mm-hmm. for sure. But enough of tangents and quarterbacks and, and all that good stuff. Um, that is basically going to wrap it up for our interview with Across the Pond. Guys, thank you so, so much for coming on and talking NFL Week 16 with me. I really I appreciate it, and you guys have some great insights. Um, where, can they, where can they find your podcast one more time before we, before we wrap it up? Uh, so you can find us on the web, atpsports.net. Um, you can also find us on social media. Um, across the pond sports podcast on facebook instagram um, on twitter at atp sports pod um, and we're all over um anywhere you listen to podcasts really um just uh, type in across the pond sports podcast um, and you'll be able to to listen to us yeah and we also have a facebook group too so join our, our facebook group and um and join in on the conversations that we have whether it's football or basketball or WNBA or MLB, there, there's always some sports being discussed in our Facebook group. Yeah, and thank you guys so, so much for coming on. I know that we had a lot of, you know, time zones and everything is crazy right now, but I appreciate you both being able to take time out of your day to come on. And um, I really appreciate it. So we are going to go back to our regular scheduled podcast programming. All right, guys, so I hope that you all enjoyed that interview with James and Katie of Across the Pond podcast. Uh, I know I did. I had a lot of fun doing it. So make sure that you check their podcast out. Um, And while it's out of date now, I was on their podcast doing picks for week 16. If you don't care and you want to see maybe if I was right or not, you can definitely check that out. So we are a little bit of a different layout this week. Um, Instead of doing all of our segments, we're only going to do our Let's Talk About It segment and our Feel Good Story to end off our show. So without further ado, guys, let's get into our Let's Talk About It segment. And this week, we are going to talk about football friendships. Yes. And specifically, specifically, we are going to talk about Josh Allen and Stephon Diggs, because I mentioned earlier that we were going to talk about this Bills-Patriots game just a little bit more. In terms of what happened, um, yes, the Bills won. The Bills look great. The Bills are spectacular. Josh Allen is spectacular. The Bills are just so great, and I would actually really like to see them in the Super Bowl. That is a whole other thing there. So what we're going to talk about, though, 
is Josh Allen and Stephon Diggs. Because if you guys haven't noticed, they are such good friends. And I wanted to talk about this because there were so many videos of them being so cute together and doing like all this best friend stuff. And I know Stefan Diggs, he's the new guy this year. He came from Minnesota last year, came to the Bills where he's obviously a perfect fit. And him and Josh Allen have been absolutely electric, just spectacular. It's incredible. So if you guys didn't see it, there was a video, which I've literally, I tweeted it out. I put it on my Instagram, everything of Josh Allen throwing the ball to the sidelines during warmups and almost hitting Stefan Diggs and Stefan Diggs whipping his head around and looking at Josh Allen like, did you just throw that ball at me? And then him throwing the ball back at Josh Allen, Josh Allen catching it and then doing a whip with it, like the whip dance move. I have watched that and I'm not exaggerating roughly 57 times. It is so cute and so pure and so adorable. I absolutely, I'm just dying for it. I am in love with them. And also then at the end of the game, they were interviewed. Josh Allen and Stefan Diggs were both interviewed at the same time. And Josh Allen's just, they're like, oh, like, what's your bond like? And Josh Allen's like, yes, this guy is great. He knows everything about me. He's reliable, this and that. And he mentioned to say he knows all of my ins and outs. And Stefan Diggs just went, pause. And he said, I hate you. And obviously there's some sexual innuendos there, which is very funny because it's just like a very guy, like brotherly thing to do is to make fun of you for saying something that's like, that's what she said moment. And he just like looked at me, he's like, oh, I hate you. And then kept talking and oh my God, I, j- I just, I love it. I absolutely love their friendship. It's so cute. It's so pure. They're obviously like really good friends on the field, off the field. They connect well. This, there was one throw in this game, in the Bills Patriots game, where I swear to God, I was like, there's no way that ball was caught. And Josh Allen threw the ball. It looked like the defender had almost like gotten in the way of the ball. Somehow Stefan Diggs caught it and everybody was melting. They were like, oh my God, that was gorgeous. And I really hope that the Bills don't choke in the playoffs because I really think that even if they don't make it to the Super Bowl, what a playoff run that they are going to have. I'm so serious. They looked great against the Patriots last night. Well, it's Tuesday on Monday night. It was so, it was, oh, I can't speak enough of the Bills. I can't speak enough of Josh Allen and I can't speak enough of Stephon Diggs, but their friendship is so good. I think that's what makes this team so good is that their chemistry works really, really well. We even saw a blocking tight end score a touchdown, which was so fun. He's this really big guy. Lee Smith, I believe his name was. An offensive lineman rolled in and like pummeled him to the ground in celebration. It's like beating him up. It was so just so cute and so good. I just, I love the Bills. I love, they are my AFC team that I root for. They are a New York team, a winning New York team with a winning record and a winning division. I would just, I love, I love it. I love it. And I can't speak more about it because you guys would just be so sick of me just gushing over Josh Allen and Stefan Diggs. So moral of the story here is that I love the Bills. I love their friendship. I love everything about what's going on in the Bills locker room It's just great, and I think that they definitely deserve the division this year. I think I said it way in, like, August. I said the Bills were going to win the division this year. So really exciting stuff, and I really, really love Stephon Diggs and Josh Allen. (laughs) I will stop saying that now. But anyway, that's what I wanted to do our Let's Talk About It segment on this week. So finally, let's wrap up our show with our Feel Good Story of the Week And this week, um, this got a lot of recognition on Instagram and Twitter and social media and all that good stuff. Um, And it was the video of offensive lineman Ben Jones from the Titans who walked barefoot outside in Lambeau Field before they played the the Packers, excuse me, on Sunday Night Football. So a lot of people were like kind of making fun. They were like, oh, my God, this guy is just walking on without his shoes on and his shorts in the snow. It's like, haha, so funny. But the feel good story in this is that there is a deeper meaning behind Ben Jones and his 
ritual of walking out into the field with no shoes on. So obviously I didn't know this, not being a Titans fan and not really following that team so closely, but Ben Jones has been doing this for years. Apparently every game he walks out into the field with no shoes on, and it's a ritual that he's had since high school to honor his late brother Clay. And Clay and him, one time, they played high school ball together, I believe, and Clay was very superstitious. And I believe Ben was also a little superstitious when they were playing ball together that he said to him, you know, I feel like we should walk outside and walk around the field uh, before this game. So they didn't really have a lot of time. They didn't have time to put their shoes on. So they walked out onto their high school field and walked around the, the, you know, the field and walked back in and then had their game and they won. And obviously it became a tradition for them because they thought that it would help them win. And it's a very sweet moment. Um, a lot of people don't know what happened to his brother, but um, I didn't want to look too far into it and you know to bring up anything. But the the whole point here is that Ben Jones does this for his brother Clay, and it doesn't matter what's going on outside. There was snow on the ground. It was freezing. It was still snowing when he went outside, and, like, it's not just like he was just walking on snow. It was snowing pretty hard in Green Bay on Sunday, so it didn't stop him from walking out, doing his ritual, walking out onto the field. Unfortunately, it didn't work for the Titans this week, but nonetheless, he walked out. He did his thing. He walked in the snow with no shoes on. And he came back and he does it for his brother, Clay. And I think that that's just really sweet. And it's really, I love things like this. You know, if if he never did this and it never was snowing, you know, this would have never gotten any recognition. And I was like, oh, my God, this is so silly. This man is walking outside with no shoes on and all that stuff. But I found out that there was a deeper meaning behind it. And I thought that that was very pure and very sweet of um, everyone to kind of report on this story as a feel good story. So I wanted to end the show off with that story for you guys. And that is going to do it for our show this week. I know I'm sorry we didn't do all of our segments, but you know, again, I don't want to make these episodes so flipping long that you guys get bored. So next week, our, you know, most of our segments will come back, but we did do our let's talk about it. So we got that in. And guys, thank you so much for listening this week. I hope that you enjoyed the interview with Across the Pond. It was a lot of fun to do. Um, make sure that you check out their podcast and make sure that you follow us and subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, all podcasting platforms, as well as on YouTube. Press the subscribe button and turn on notifications to make sure that you know when I post new videos, mini segments, extra content videos, all that good stuff. And make sure that you follow us on social media, TGWTS Podcast on both Twitter and on Instagram. And everyone, you won't see me until next year. I hope everyone has a happy and safe new year. Please, please, please be safe this year. It's a little different than usual. We can't go and party like we usually do. But I hope that you guys all have a great new year. And um, we have one more, one more week. One more week of regular season football to go, and then it's playoff time, baby. So, guys, I love you. I love you. Thank you so much for listening this week. I hope that you all have a fun, fantastic, sports-filled day, and I will see you guys all next week for NFL Week 17. Bye!